Shabbat Shalom family to the 12 tribes, to the natural branches, and to the branches grafted in. And I'd like to give all praise, thanks, and worship to Yahweh, Yahweh Shai, and the Ruach HaKodesh for this lesson today. If you see any following in this lesson, know that it's me, not Yahweh, Yahweh Shai, or the Ruach HaKodesh. If you're curious in any of these matters, by all means, look into it for yourself. So with that said, we're going to be reading out of the second epistle of Peter, and we're going to be reading chapter 1. Now, the name of this lesson is Second Peter and the Steps to Holiness Decoded. Now, two years ago, I was reading over this chapter, and the Most High pointed out this chapter and how significant it is to people's everyday lives, even though we tend to overlook it. So the Most High points out that this scripture is very important to our everyday lives and how we often take his scriptures for granted and we don't really look too in depth on certain things that grab our curiosity. Now this uh, Second Peter and the Steps to Holiness Decoded, uh, we're going to be reading Second Peter and chapter 1 verses 4 through 11. Now, before I say anything extra, I'm going to be letting you know that I am going to be reading off of the notes that the Most High has downloaded uh, unto me a while ago. Because he did download this unto me uh, about a month or so ago, but I've just been slacking on getting this out to the family, and I sincerely apologize for this, but uh, here you go. And we're essentially just going to get started. Uh, I've also posted this on Ahiel's forum as well. And so uh, this isn't about my proclamation of myself. This is uh, to proclaim uh, the Most High and the steps that he's downloaded. So if you will go with me to the second epistle, of Peter, and chapter 1, and we're going to start here at verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the nature of Yahuwah, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now here in verse 4, here is what uh, the Most High downloaded unto me through the Holy Spirit in the notes. So I wrote down, one must flee from the lusts of their own hearts, since our own lusts produce sin. It is necessary to leave or fast from the world and try to be clean to get into the presence of Hawa. Once you are not enslaved to your own lusts, it is easier to obey Hawa, Yahweh Shai, and the rule of Kakodesh. Now there are precepts to these little notes here. Because it starts off saying that we must flee from our the lust of our own hearts, right? Verse 4, oh, we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises because we started to deal with the Most High, and He's promised us everlasting life, a place in the kingdom. He's promised us the Holy Ghost. He's promised us repentance and remission of sins, right? He's pretty much promised us a pure and holy lifestyle. And so uh, the verse continues that by these you might be partakers of the nature of Hawa, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, we are partakers of the nature of the Creator, and we've escaped the corruption that is the world through lust. Now, how did we uh, escape this uh, corruption that came in through lust? How do you do that? Well, if we go up to verse 3, it says, As he has given unto us all things that pertain unto the power of Hawa to life and the fear of Hawa through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Right? And so what this is pointing out is that for us to be able to overcome lusts, we, that is a gift. To be able to overcome your lusts. That is a gift from the creator. So you start off you know, being redeemed from your lust, being forgiven, uh, saved out of your lust, being able to overcome those lusts. So that's why I have it written in the notes. Uh, one must flee from the lust of their own hearts, since our own lusts produce sin. Now, of course, the precept for that is in the book of James in chapter 1. Now, if you'll flip over there with me real quick, and we'll read verses 13 through 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of Hawa. For Hawa cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Now this can go uh, on its own lesson, but essentially to put it in summary, what this is saying 
as that. All the devil can do is tempt you. He can entice you, but he can't uh, force you to sin. Uh, I have another page of notes, and I'll read for you a quote uh, that I actually got off of an Instagram post, but it applies very well to this. And the uh, Instagram post uh, was by a man that's uh, IDK what Nick be on. But essentially, he's a really uh, deep brother who is really in depth with the scriptures and on accord with the creator. But essentially, he wrote, if something seduces you, it has no power over you. It is petitioning you for permission. We love to blame spirits or Satan for our errors, but you must be compliant with an act for it to be done through you. Uh, all anything can do is get your attention. Even if it pursues you, it can't force. So essentially, it's not the creator who causes you to sin. Neither is it Satan, because all Satan can do is say, hey, you might want to do this or hey, you should do this. Or, hey, that, that uh, piece of bacon over there is looking pretty crispy and it's smelling really good. I know you want to take a bite. But thing is, you don't have to listen to what he's saying. You can resist that. The thing is, if you obey Satan's temptation, you're the one that's giving in to that sin. You're the one that is uh, compliant with that. Now then, uh, continuing with this little uh, note here, it says, uh, I wrote, it is necessary to leave or fast from the world and to try to be clean to get into the presence of Hawa. Uh, once you are not enslaved to your lusts, it is easier to obey Hawa, Yahweh Shai, and the Ruach HaKodesh. Now the precepts for this, really quick, is from the fifth saying of the Agrafa. And we'll pull that up real quick. And so the fifth saying of the Agrafa, or the hidden words of Jesus, is, Jesus said, except you fast from the world, you shall in no wise find the kingdom of God and except you keep the Sabbath as a Sabbath, you shall not see the Father. Right, so you need to fast from the world, you need to be holy and sanctified to understand where the Creator is coming from, so you can overcome your lusts. And now there's another precept in the Gospel of Thomas, except it'll be the 27th saying. So we're going to pull that real quick, pull that up. And so the 27th saying of the Gospel of Thomas, if you do not fast from the world, you will not find the kingdom. If you do not observe the Sabbath as a Sabbath, you will not see the Father. Right, so both these, these are two witnesses right here telling you that you need to fast from the world. And when you fast, you abstain from it. You're abstaining from the ways of the world. You're doing what uh, the book of Revelation says is, come out of her, my people. Right, so now we're going to go back into the second epistle, Peter, and we're going to read verse 5 because now we're gonna get into the steps of holiness because now we just escaped our lust, right? We're building up that foundation. Now we can start uh, following the steps to holiness. So verse five, and besides this, giving all diligence, add to your belief, virtue, add to virtue, knowledge. Now I'm gonna to read to you uh, the notes that I have concerning verse five. So give all diligence to, or pay attention to your situation in all aspects possible and hearken to the Creator. Enact the previous step or overcome your own lusts. All right, so that's the first part. And besides this, giving all diligence. So as you're giving diligence, you're paying attention to your situation and you're applying the overcoming of your lusts. Now the next part of verse five, it says, add to your belief, virtue, or add to your faith, virtue. All right, so in the notes, uh, I had it written down when the Holy Spirit was downloading. Uh, I wrote down, add to your faith virtue or add morals to your lack of lusts and set boundaries. Now, if you're wondering where I got morals from, I'll pull up Blue Letter Bible or Bible Hub and go to Second Epistle Peter and verse 5 and click on the Greek etymology for that word virtue. And it'll let you know that it essentially means morals. So add to your faith, morals. So uh, add morals to your lack of lust now, because remember the most high has allowed you to overcome your lust. So to be able to maintain that, you need to set up some morals or boundaries so you don't fall back into those same sins and temptations and you're not constantly uh, giving heed to what the devil is trying to make you do or what he's trying to tempt you to do. So you're not uh, listening to him, you're resisting him a bit more. 
right? And so after, and so this last section of verse five, it says, add to virtue knowledge. So in the notes I recorded uh, from the download of the Holy Spirit, uh, add to virtue knowledge. This is where applying the Torah comes in. Now, of course, when you hear Torah, you think, oh, that's just Jewish religion, or that's just uh, five books of Moses. But if you look for at the etymology of Torah, it just means instruction. I'm sorry, excuse me. It just means instruction. So by that uh, etymology, pretty much anything that is scripture is Torah. If it's apocryphal, oh, quote unquote, apocryphal or quote unquote, pseudepigraphal. That could also be counted as Torah because it's giving you instructions on how to live right. This uh, first chapter of the second epistle of Peter could be considered Torah because it is giving you instruction or a command on how to be holy. It's giving you instructions on how to enact that. Right? So add to virtue knowledge. This is where applying the Torah comes in. You are consistently learning from the Bible and apocryphal scripture and precepts. As you start to apply your morals, adapt them to what you are learning. Now you're having morals and you're setting up boundaries to resist your sin. Right now, if you're not doing this according to knowledge, you're going to do it according to how you feel. And then you're going to start doing it religiously. And now you're going to start building unhealthy cycles of boundaries. You're going to be doing it according to the precepts of men and according to the ways of the world, which will eventually lead you into that priesthood of Mahan type mindset that Elder Big Judah has been talking about and Elder Ahiel Ben Gad, Ben Yashrela and Elder Sabal have been talking about. And so continuing on from there, right? So now we're applying our morals and now we're adapting our morals to the scripture. Now there is a book called Ethics and the Old Testament where the author is justifying the Old Testament, quote unquote Old Testament and the laws thereof. Now, an argument in one of the chapters is that uh, the Torah, or uh, in this sense, as I refer to it as the books of Moses, is that this is simply natural law. And when I mean natural law, I mean laws of the nature, that it's just natural to do these things. Like it's natural to not lie down to sleep with your immediate family. It is natural to not want to sleep with an animal. It is natural to keep the dietary law because there are animals that are meant to be eaten for your health and there are animals that are not to be eaten, which will hinder your health. Right. So if you look at all the different laws, you see how different laws of nature can apply to it. And you have to look at it through the Hebrew mindset, through the mindset of our creator and uh, as well as his son and our high priest, Yahawashai, also through the high the mindset, not the hijack, but the mindset of our earthly mother, who is wisdom. So if you look through that and you're adapting your morals and you're going to be in a healthy mindset. Now, from there, we're going to go into verse six. It says, add to knowledge, temperance and to temperance, patience and to patience, the fear of Hawa. Right. So in the notes, uh, when I was getting the download, this is what I wrote add to knowledge temperance or control your emotions after you have begun applying your morals and boundaries because now you have the scripture uh adapting to your morals and now you're starting to begin to either feel upset or humbled uh, according to these things that you're learning you're starting to learn the reasons behind a lot of this and the reason it's telling you to be temperance is because we don't fight against flesh and blood people we fight against spiritual powers and principalities in high places. So if you're focused on the flesh and you're not uh, being temperate, then you're going to start leading the children of men astray because now you're in a negative mindset and a negative energy and you're uh, repelling people away from the creator. And that is, of course, one side to that. Uh, one, one side, one explanation for temperance. Right, so, or control your emotions after you've begun applying your morals and boundaries. And it's also to help you uh, keep a cool mind so that when you are defending the scriptures and you are uh, doing your part in speaking the truth, it's so people don't think it's you. It's so people know that it's not you, but it's what uh, the creator has given you to share. Right, and it also shows that this is one of the fruits of the spirit, actually, temperance. 
And so continuing from that, uh, added temperance, patience. So uh, I recorded in my notes, uh, added temperance, patience, or be patient with both others and yourself, because both you and others have to adapt to this new version of you being created. Because remember, there, you have to fight against those familiar spirits of uh, people who knew you before you came into the truth or before you knew Yahweh Shai and Hawa as you do this day. And as you're coming out of these pagan holidays and as you're coming out of these uh, worldly practices, people are going to know you as, you know, when you were. But as you're trying to detox out of that, you have to be patient with them because they have to accept the fact that this isn't who you are anymore. And, you know, you also have to accept the fact that this isn't who you are anymore and you're not obligated uh, to feel a certain way about not keeping these holidays because the creator, we have to remember, he is his own entity. Just as, you know, if I were to talk to you, you are your own entity. You are separate from me as your own person. I don't determine your thoughts. I don't determine your emotions. I don't determine any of that. Uh, like, you know, for good or for evil, you know, every person is essentially uh, in control of the decisions they make to do good or evil. And so likewise, when we look at the creator, we have to realize that he is his own entity. He has the ability to make his own decisions. We have to remember he's all powerful and almighty. And so we, we know him as this creator who consistently uh, humbles himself before us so that he can talk to us and help us and forgive us of our sins. But we forget sometimes that he does have his own boundaries. He does have his own morals, his own things that he is not willing to cross. He has his own, he is his own person. And we forget that sometimes. So to be able to acknowledge that he is his own person, that shows we are not obligated to follow after other spirits behind these people. Because remember, we're dealing with spirits, not the people themselves. The spirits move uh, through those people, those familiar, those familiar spirits move through those people that we really care about to try to hurt us. So that's why we need to be patient with the people because they don't know what they're doing. That's why Yahweh I said, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was looking in the spiritual aspect. He saw that it was Satan moving upon the hearts of the people of the house of Israel. And it wasn't really the people themselves. That's why here in these latter generations, Yahweh has had mercy upon the children of Israel because of the sins of the fathers. It's because he's starting to lay the punishment back on the spirits who caused that initial transgression rather than uh, the people themselves, the children themselves as they're coming into that spirit of repentance. Satan is taking back his spot as that Azazel or the scapegoat to have the sins laid upon him so he can go to hell and suffer that punishment and be put far away from the people. So uh, continuing with this, uh, add a temperance patience, right? So be patient with yourself because both with yourself and others because both you and them have to adapt to this new version of you being created. Now then add to patience the fear of Hawa, right? So then in the notes I recorded when the Holy Spirit was downloading, uh, she essentially said, add to patience the fear of Hawa or don't let your patience be an excuse to allow yourself to sin. Be consistent with your fear of Hawa and establish the line in the sand that you will not cross or establish your boundaries. This is how you will manifest the respect for the Creator and the witnesses in heaven. When I say the witnesses in heaven, I mean the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So essentially, now that you're being patient with others and you're allowing them to adapt to who you are, and you're also allowing yourself to adapt to who you are, uh, who the Creator is making you be, uh, you need to have that fear of the Creator of saying, yes, I have I'm having patience with you because yes, you're not quite used to who uh, I'm being made to be, but that doesn't mean I'm going to give you uh, the right to cross these boundaries. To give an example, right? Let's say you're trying to uh, refrain from eating pork, right? And you're consistently telling your family who uh, may eat a lot more pork. And now you've been saying this for weeks, you know, I'm not eating pork, I'm not eating pork, but you know, they're still uh, trying to push it and they're making mostly meals that do not eat pork because uh, you like to usually eat as a family, right? And so now you're going to have to start establishing that boundary of saying, okay, I've been telling you for a while that I'm not eating pork, but yet consistently have you been making food with pork in it and you haven't told me that it's in there until after, uh, you know, I've done and eaten it. 
And so now to be consistent in your fear of Hawa, and so you're not coming off as a hypocrite and you're establishing that, and yes, they may not like you, but you know, take that uh, step of being uncomfortable in your situation rather than building up a secret resentment uh, in your heart for them because they're not listening to you and as well as causing evil in the sight of your creator of you just consistently sinning and just allowing them to step over your boundaries. And now you would uh, go out and pretty much buy your own food at that point. So now you're going to be eating that and you're cooking that for yourself. And you're not allowing them to cook for you anymore because they showed themselves uh, untrustworthy at that point to be able to not put uh, pork in your food as you're trying not to eat that. Now, uh, continuing on from there, right? So we have add the patience to fear of Hawa. So be consistent, establish your boundaries. So then we're going to go now down to verse seven out of second Peter and chapter one. So verse seven, add to the fear of the creator, brotherly kindness, add to brotherly kindness, love, right? So in the notes when the Holy Spirit was downloading, uh, she said, and I recorded, uh, add to the fear of Hawa, brotherly kindness, or treat your brethren as you would have them treat you in all manner of action, speech, and thought. Extend this unto strangers, and if they reject you, then so be it. This goes into that concept of uh, you go out and speak the truth, and if they reject you, you wipe the dust off from your sandals. Because remember what Yahawashai said, um, extend the unto strangers, because even uh, the strangers... Uh, pretty much they extend kindness unto people who they know they're going to get kindness back out of them. And so if you extend it unto people who if you're not quite sure is going to be kind to you, then you're going to receive a greater reward because they might be kind to you now you've made a new friend. And if they're not kind to you and they become your enemy, well at least you know they're your enemy now and it's okay to set them at a distance to separate yourself from them. Uh, on a certain level that Yahweh will allow you to do regardless if it's uh, on an emotional level or at a physical level. So then it says, uh, be respectful about the fact that the boundary has been established. Right, so verse 7, uh, and add to the fear of the creator, brotherly kindness. So now you're being kind about the fact that you've established this boundary, that you're following the most high creator and you're not willing to transgress that law, statue, and covenant that you've made and having the faith of the Son and keeping the commandments of the Father. So you're being respectful about the fact that this is what you're doing, and you're being respectful about the fact that people are where they're at, and you expect them to be respectful with you of where you're at as well. So then in this last part of verse seven, add brotherly kindness, love, right? So I recorded in the notes, uh, add to brotherly kindness, love, or manifest your care for others in your actions and carry out the previous step, or uh, what was just mentioned. Uh, be ready to give your life for your brethren as well, since our brother, our high priest and shepherd has done this for us. Uh, the sheep is not above his shepherd, so as he has done, it will be expected for us. Yahweh I laid down his life for his sheep, and so as we are his sheep, we are expected to lay down our lives for one another. Now we're going to go to verse 8. And so this reads, For if these things be in you and abound, they shall they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Adonai, Yahusha HaMashiach. So in the notes uh, I reported, Peter says, If all these things abound in you, you shall not be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Yahusha HaMashiach. This is the way to be the seed that fell on good ground in Yahushai's parable of the scattered seeds. And then we're going to read verse 9. But he that lacks these is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from old sins. And my notes I wrote down, he also says that if any man lacks them, he is unable to see afar off, which is likely into eternity, and that he has forgotten the truth of Yahushai HaMashiach. Now we're going to read verses 10 and 11. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Adonai and Savior, Yehusha HaMashiach. And so, in my notes I recorded out of these two things. If you give due diligence or enact these things, so if you look at the a Greek etymology here in verse 10 for diligence under 1 Peter, uh, sorry, 2 Peter in chapter 1 in verse 10, if you click on diligence, it'll come to enacting, pretty much embodying, enacting 
of what the Most High is telling you to do. So essentially, if you give due diligence or enact these things, you will make your calling of election sure and shall never fail. You shall never fall. This way will be given to you in abundance. In verse 11, it says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Adonai and Savior, Yehusha HaMashiach. All right, so there's a precept to that in the book that was recently unsealed called The Writings of Abraham. Now I'm going to read chapter one. I'm just going to read the entire first chapter for you, all right? Because this is a perfect precept here for Second Peter in chapter one and verse 11. Here's what it says. Behold, my son, I have caused to come into thine hands a fragment of the writings of Abraham, in which he hath left a record of his sojourn among men, and of the blessings of the Lord unto him. This have I brought to thee, that thou might restore that which is lost, that the fullness of the record in its original purity might be found again among the sons of God. Behold, these things are sacred. Wherefore, send them not forth unto the children of men, but let them be for the edification of the elect, that your hearts may be, tur that your hearts may be turned unto the fathers, and ye may draw close to them, and they to you. Thus will the veil be withdrawn, and you will commune with the general assembly and church of the firstborn, and shall even be ushered back unto my presence. Go to now, and do this work which I have placed in thine hands. Hawa. So now let's go back to verse 3, because this is the precept that I was trying to tell you about in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 11. Right, so verse 11 says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Creator, of our ruler and savior, Yahweh Shai HaMashiach, right? So verse three, it says, thus will the veil be withdrawn. Sorry, in the writings of Abraham chapter one and verse three, it says, thus will the veil be withdrawn, right? So the veil, that's actually unbelief. If you go into the book of Moor and you go into the book of Ether, it'll tell you about brother Jared and how he got past the veil. And it'll also tell you that the veil is the veil of unbelief. So this is telling you if you follow these steps of holiness laid down by Peter, that the veil of unbelief will be withdrawn from you and you will commune with the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Uh, the, right, the creator right here, this is uh, Yahweh speaking right here in chapter one. He's telling you that if you follow his precepts and you follow the steps of, uh, first, of second Peter in chapter one, that not only the veil of unbelief will be withdrawn from you, but you'll be able to commune with the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Now, I'm not trying to go off topic here, but if we look into the etymology for church, that'll say in the Greek, it's uh, ecclesia, or somewhere along the lines of that, but it simply, it essentially means called out assembly or elect people. If you go back in the quote unquote Old Testament, you'll see a uh, Hebrew that this ecclesia refers to is things like in the book of Chronicles or in the books of Kings or even Exodus, where uh, Yahweh is referring to the house of Israel or the general assembly. So church is just another way of saying the general assembly, the elect. They just put the word church in there to get you into a Christian hijack type mindset, right? So uh, essentially, if you follow these precepts according to the way Yahweh has meant, uh, you'll be able to commune or be able to talk to uh, the elect and to the literal Israel and shall even be ushered back unto my presence. So the very fat last part of Writings of Abraham, chapter one and verse three, I'll read this last part after you're able to commune with a general assembly and church of the firstborn. It says, and even shall be ushered, and shall even be ushered back unto my presence. Right, so reading through the uh, Writings of Abraham is of course, you know, the main way to be ushered back into the presence of Hawa. But that precepts back here, into this second epistle of Peter because we have to go all the way back to verse 5 because it says add to belief virtue and add to virtue add to virtue knowledge because remember we're adapting our morals to the scriptures and now if we have this writings of Abraham here and we're sharing it with the brethren and the elect then we're following what the most high has said to do this uh, writings of Abraham is simply confirming what we have read in the second epistle of Peter, that an entrance is going to be ministered abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our uh, ruler, our prince and our savior, 
Yahweh Shai HaMashiach. So this writings of Abraham is saying that we shall even be ushered back. Right, so in my notes I recorded uh, concerning the second epistle of Peter that this way will be given to us in abundance. We're going to be ushered back into the kingdom because that is the straight way and the straight gate. Uh, these steps, it is Yahweh Shai HaMashiach. It's the way into Yahweh's everlasting kingdom. And so this is uh, the steps to help maintain uh, your holiness and purity after baptism. And so with that said, family, I'd like to give all praise, thanks, and worship to Yahweh, Yahweh Shai, and the Ruach HaKodesh for this lesson today. If you see any folly, any ill communication, or if you misunderstand anything, uh, I apologize for the ill, communica Ill communication on my part. And if you're curious in any of these things, and if you want to better understand them, I seriously suggest that you would look into these things for yourself. Because you could listen to what I'm saying all day, but it's not really going to settle in for you until you pray over it, you know, yourself so that you can personally understand it. And, you know, you look at these through the eyes of the Holy Spirit, uh, which Yahweh would give to you. And so with that said, family, Shalom and much shalom. Uh, can't help but say I love you all. I love Hawaii. I wish I didn't rock So with that said, Hawaii. I found love in your arms In your love is forgiveness I found peace in your heart In your name there is healing I can't stop chasing after you And I can't stop holding on to you It's your love It's your love